last speaker is uh, Dr. Dan Grove from uh, Alzheimer Europe. And Dan has been working for Alzheimer Europe since uh, 1996. Uh, she has a uh, an other degree in psychology uh, and obtained her uh, MA in education and psychoanalysis uh, and now is also a trained um, analytical uh, gestalt uh, therapist. Um, she has also obtained a PhD uh, exploring uh, DP's uh, perception of dementia and uh, how these relate to stigma and uh, tiny diagnosis. Uh, she's working on a wide range of uh, topics covering, uh, covering care, legislation, um, uh, advanced directives, and social support. Uh, and then she chairs uh, the Elton Europe Ethic Working Group, which has produced reports and uh, on uh, assistive uh, technology, dementia research, um, and a lot of other things. Um, but. Uh, Dan will present the, a sort of the, the patient's perspective in the, on informed consent, and uh, I'll give word to you, Dan. Welcome. This slide just shows the, the issues that I'm going to cover in this presentation. And whilst recognising the importance of informed consent as a framework providing measures to protect participants from harm whilst promoting their right to self-determination, I'm going to actually focus on the issue of empowerment, so trying to ensure that those who have the capacity are able to exercise self-determination and that those who don't just are nevertheless able to make their voices heard throughout the research process. I will be mentioning occasionally, for example, legal representatives, but I won't go into the legal issues. But I'd just like to draw your attention to outside of Europe's 2016 yearbook on decision-making and legal capacity which was written by Dr. Anna Diaz. And it has an interesting section showing some of the different laws and acts in, the, in various countries which have a relevance to decision-making in relation to research. So the first quote on this slide from Borga provides details of some of the criteria for informed consent, to which we should also add the voluntary nature of participation. But the second quote from Rangel highlights some of the possible implications for participants of consenting to research. But nevertheless, people take part in research for many reasons, often including altruism and a desire to contribute towards the advancement of scientific knowledge. But the potential and expected benefit to society of any study must obviously be balanced against concerns about possible harm to participants. But then again, on the other side, on the other hand, sorry, we must, we must also bear in mind that risk of harm, like potential benefit and burden, is subjective, and that benefit from the perspective of participants is not necessarily limited to the medical domain, and that people with dementia, like other members of society, we feel that have the right to take certain risks, provided that they still have the capacity to do so, or communicated their wish in advance of incapacity. So protective measures and restrictions on the right to participate in research should not unjustly discriminate against the interests, including autonomy, of those they are designed to protect. And, and so this is why we wanted to address the issue of um, empowerment. So the first point I'd like to make in this respect is about assumptions surrounding the concepts of dementia and capacity. There are many different ways to perceive dementia, and in 2013, drafted an overview of explanatory models reflecting how people make sense of dementia and the ethical implications of those perceptions. So, for example, some people perceive dementia as part of natural aging, as a biomedical condition, a mental disorder, or at the same time as a disability, and even due to spiritual forces. There are a very wide range of, of ways of making sense of dementia. And one area of particular relevance is that surrounding stereotypes of dementia consisting of generalised associations between people with dementia and symptoms which are actually typically common in the advanced stages of dementia. And this has implications for respect for autonomy in that there's a risk of assumptions being made about the capacity to consent to research. So, for example, that a person would obviously, in inverted commas, be unable to consent because they have dementia. And so this is why I wanted to highlight on this slide an extract from our report on the ethics of dementia research, in which we state that a person should be deemed capable of consent unless proven otherwise, 
that the knowledge or belief that a person has dementia should be considered as reasonable grounds for doubt concerning his or her capacity to consent to research and to justify the assessment of his or her capacity, but that a diagnosis of dementia or the belief or presumption that a person has dementia should never be considered as sufficient proof that a person lacks the capacity to consent to research. It's important also to bear in mind that capacity is not an all or nothing matter, and that people possess, may possess capacity in relation to a specific task at a specific moment in time, but not in relation to another. Nevertheless, a person either has the capacity to make a decision about participating in a particular study, perhaps with appropriate support, and I'll come back to this later, or doesn't. Having a legally appointed representative doesn't necessarily mean that a person lacks the ability to consent to research. A guardianship measure may have been set up for certain domains or activities, for example, to handle financial matters, and the guardian might not even have the authority to make decisions about um, consent to research. So this would depend on the nature of the guardianship measure and the legislation in a particular country surrounding proxy decision making. In addition to avoiding assumptions related to perceptions of dementia and capacity, it's important to recognise dementia as a potential disability. So measures should be taken to ensure that the informed consent procedure doesn't hinder the full and effective participation of people with dementia in research on an equal basis with others, based on failure to provide what is known as reasonable accommodation. So whilst we need to ensure that appropriate structures are in place to protect the rights of people with dementia who are unable to consent, we also need to consider ways to empower people with dementia who do have the necessary capacity to consent, to ensure that the informed consent procedure maximises their potential to do so, and that it doesn't serve to unjustly exclude them from research or to make them prematurely dependent on legally designated representatives. So one way to do this is to consider how having dementia may impact on the ability to provide informed consent, not in terms of whether the person has the necessary capacity, which they obviously must have, that they're not under pressure and that they can communicate their decision, but rather how various impairments linked to having dementia may make it difficult to manage the whole process surrounding informed consent, and what kind of support might make that process more manageable, so it's a matter of empowerment and removing barriers to participation. So we need to consider ways to promote dementia friendliness in the context of informed consent. So this might include dementia-friendly documentation, such as letters of invitation, participant information sheets, and consent forms, developing dementia-friendly procedures, so allowing people the support that they need from a person of their choice, taking care not to overload or stress people, and thinking about the very practical arrangements. Um, dementia-friendly environment, so that would mean conducting an assessment in a way which pays attention to the surroundings which might influence the, the person's capacity. For example, in the case of dementia, to lighting, mirrors, floors, patterns which make it difficult to judge depth, distances to walk, so signposting, availability of toilets, etc. And then also communicating in a dementia-friendly manner, so again, not overloading with information perhaps using technologies and materials to facilitate understanding, paying attention to the complexity of language used, but not asking or communicating several ideas or questions at the same time. Um, informed consent shouldn't be considered as a one-off event which ends with the signature of a document, and I think this was mentioned earlier. And consent to various tests or procedures or to data sharing can be obtained, should be obtained or confirmed at various intervals throughout the study. And I hear I was very interested in Surin's um, information about dynamic consent and also Stephen's dialogic approach of the continuing dialogue. And similarly, we need to ensure that even if a person does have a legally designated representative, they're nevertheless kept informed and involved in decision making throughout the whole project. In cases where a person lacks the capacity to consent but is involved in, in the research, his or her assent should be sought at regular intervals. And with regard to withdrawal from the study, it's, it's very important to pay attention to the possible desire to withdraw 
but also to bear in mind the potential conflict of interest of researchers in the sense that they're responsible for the well-being of participants, but they also have a vested interest in maintaining participants in the study. And I would, I would be interested in, in your views on this, but I would argue that a person who lacks the, ca the capacity to withdraw from a study should not be depend solely dependent on a legal representative to do this on their behalf, and that this, the same level of capacity needed to decide on participation in a study, bearing in mind the potential risks and burden, should not be necessary in the case of a designer to withdraw from it. Researchers should envisage involving people with dementia in the context of public and patient involvement, PCI, so as to involve it, so sorry, to improve the experience of research participants with dementia. So for example, this might involve providing feedback and advice on the suitability of documentation or procedures. And Alzheimer Europe has recently developed a position paper on PCI and, and dementia research, and this will be available soon, which we just need to have this approved by Alzheimer's Europe board at the end of February. Before concluding with the statement from, I'd like to give you the statement from a person with dementia, which demonstrates the complexity of the issue and the importance of listening to what people with dementia think about these issues. I'd like to summarise by emphasising the importance of providing a framework for informed consent, which offers not only sufficient protection from potential harm, but also the necessary support to empower people with dementia as far as possible, to be involved in research and to ensure that their voices are heard, even if they lack the capacity to give informed consent. Okay. I'm just going to read through you Hillary's perspective. Hillary was previously Vice Chair of the European Working Group of People with Dementia. So Hillary states, dementia adds an additional layer of complexity to all aspects of research, whether it's be engaging participants in the research cycle or as an active participant in a research study or drug trial. Over the last three years, I've been involved in one clinical trial and at least eight non-clinical research studies. Without exception, consent mechanisms have been clear, followed to the letter, and have given me no cause for concern. Having said that, I'm in the early stages of dementia and still have sufficient cognitive ability to make decisions for myself. Once I hand over decision-making to my husband, I already know that he is unlikely to consent to me signing up to any study considered high risk. And I've, I've, I've extracted this bit there. And my counter-argument is that if I am at a stage where I am incapable of making decisions, do not dismiss any request without an in-depth analysis of whether it may help me. By that stage, not doing nothing means the inevitable outcome, and I would not want to rely on other brave people for putting themselves forward in effect on my behalf. All I ask is that researchers can conform to whatever legislation and good practice is in effect at the time, and my husband carries out my wishes. What more can I ask for? I'd like to leave you with those words. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Any questions? Hello. Uh, I don't know whether that was the, the, the case for, for those of you. I think I, I could follow you, um, but I was wondering whether you could possibly try to turn it up um, for, for questions and answers now. Um, my, my starting question would be, um, I mean, the, the, the Human Brain Project is uh, not specifically geared towards um, dementia or Alzheimer, um, but of course it, it touches on, on uh, that to some degree. And I, I was just wondering, uh, in your experience with more specific uh, research topics or research projects in, in this field, um, and I'm thinking of, of the ADNI, uh, the, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, uh, or others like that, um, whether you've been involved in, um, in this sort of project, whether you've been involved in, in setting up the research um, and giving practical advice to, to the researchers on how, how to follow your, your suggestions and how to make research and informed consent more dementia friendly. Well, we, we've been in, well, we're involved in the EPAD study, for example, and so, so that's one. Are you familiar with that? No. So, so that's the Euro, um, European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia, and so that's setting up um, various cohorts and eventually it's going to be a, a different way of approaching clinical trials. But at the moment, the, 
very much try in the process of, of setting up participant panels to, in, to give feedback on the recruitment process and also to try to improve the participation of people, well, actually people without dementia, but people in the, uh, with preclinical Alzheimer's their participation throughout the whole process. And one of one of our reasons for setting for writing the position paper on um, PPI and dementia research was to provide guidance on that. So it's a very I think it's about maybe ten pages of, of um, complete um, guidance on how to involve people with dementia in, in a, a wide variety wide range of research. It's actually been in the process also of being endorsed by the Interdem Research Group, which is um, fo focuses on psychosocial research. And yeah, we've also been approached um, through the European Working Group of People with Dementia, which is the, the group which we, where we have a member with a person with dementia from different countries, ten people with different types of dementia from different countries, and they advise us on all our work. And and our, uh, certain pharmaceutical companies, for example, have been, have contacted us and asked us how they could involve people with dementia to try to make their um, research materials more dementia friendly. And so then we, we've asked for the um, involvement of our working group and they've actually commented in concrete terms on the actual materials that would be then used by the research group, but for a clinical trial, for example. Okay, I, I think it would be really useful if you could share some of the, the, the output and, and some of those uh, guidance documents with us so we can um, refer to them in, in our um, informed consent um, standard operating procedures as, as an example of, of good practice. Yeah, we'd be pleased to, to share those and, and normally the board will formally approve the paper, the position paper at the end of February so I, I could send it to you after that and also it would by then have been um, endorsed by Interdent. Okay. But it would also yeah. be important f um, for us as an organisation perhaps to obtain feedback from you know a different type of research setting on how on what, how, what you think of our guidelines on how to involve people with dementia in the in the research process. So we would also welcome your feedback. Okay. Yeah. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, it took me a while to get my audio going. This is Kevin Grimes, Karolinska. I'm with the project um, and also a psychologist and forensic psychologist uh, from Boston. The, uh, I appreciated Diane's uh, discussion of the dementia situation, uh, having worked with uh, all sorts of degenerative uh, diseases and dealing with competency issues. It, it opens up a whole layer of, of um, the, um, the person who acts on the behalf of the, let's say, patient for the moment, um, who um, we, we assume has uh, uh, capacity to be the responsible person, but that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes even um, uh, legal representatives um, may come to a situation and carry their own their own banner uh, about an issue. Um, uh, I had a case where a, a, a psychoanalytic um, um, uh, individual was the uh, the, the um, guardian for uh, Huntington's patient. And, and it was very difficult to work it out because of the, um, the clinician's interest of um, work, working out uh, some kind of um, um, uh, issue uh, that, he, that he assumed that Huntington patient uh, had about uh, life, um, uh, continuing to live, um, the right to die, and so on. But these get very sticky, and I wonder if you could comment about um, uh, how those issues might be addressed. Yeah, that's a difficult one because um, if the actual legal system doesn't actually have measures in, in place to um, to verify the capacity of the, the the person who may be consenting on behalf of another person, that's very very difficult issue. But also, from when when you're talking about people making decisions on behalf of another person, there's the the potential to to stereotype and also to for value judgments to come into place. Mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I don't actually know what the solution is, and I'm just looking at as well as at the um, our work on legal, on decision making and legal capacity, where it's actually stated in some countries in the absence of a legal representative, a member of the family, 
can consent to research on behalf of a person. And I think that's also a very tricky issue because there are certain relationships are not always positive within families and there can be um, power relations and power, power issues at stake. So I don't have the answer, but I do, I do, I do agree that it's a very difficult issue. I, I appreciate that. I think um, I think we are in agreement that there is an issue about it um, and uh, something to keep an eye out for. Okay, are there, are there any specific questions to Diane? Um, I was just wondering if um, you had any thoughts on the way that research design happens. So, for instance, in the European context, um, someone submits a proposal and it's approved or not, and that's based on the program of work they're going to carry out. But the picture of consent that you're talking about seems to require quite a complicated um, dynamism, uh, which makes that model really quite problematic. So it could be the case that uh, looking at look through the lens of informed consent and, and, and particularly patients with dementia, um, it suggests that there could be uh, at least an impetus to revise the model of research funding as well as to try and do what we're doing now and cope with informed consent issues as they arise. I wonder if you'd come across that or had any thoughts. That me? Are you, t are you asking me? Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> I think that um, the, research is, the, the research design and the way that informed consent is handled, I don't mean that it's problematic, but I think it does require some thought, especially with regard to people with dementia. But when, when you're saying that there's a research design and there's a proposal is submitted, if it's approved or not, I think that that's one area where, where PPI can be very important in actually involving people with dementia in the research design and, talk, and, and exchanging ideas, for example, about issues surrounding the loss of capacity after having given consent and how that can be handled. And there's, um, there are some, there's some research groups at the moment where they're actually trying to encourage um, interaction between PhD students to give them the opportunity to, to discuss issues and to get feedback from people with dementia before, before they actually put in their, their um, before they finalise the research design and submit the proposal for ethical approval. So I, I, again, I don't have the exact answer, but I do think it's important to involve people with dementia in, in, individually in studies, in studies, in the, in the in the research design, but also more generally to to open up the discussion, for example, at national and European level about these issues. Thank you. I also have an observation about. Uh, if I was looking at the presentation on Alzheimer patients, oh, I I have a lot of noise in the background. Do you have it? Yeah, there's yeah. some feedback. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, my question is: if you switch up the microphones. Okay. If you are um, if you are uh, writing operational procedures, maybe an important point is who will be in charge of collecting the informed consent. Uh, especially on the data use, because in, in our general view in a hospital, an informed consent is something that is shared by the doctor or the nurse and the patient. But actually, the consent on the use of data is part of the administrative stuff that you sign when you enter into a hospital. And so it's an administrative person who is in charge of collecting uh, your signature. And I'm not sure that uh, administrative people is really trained in a proper way to collect an informed consent from a patient. Uh, and I think that sometimes, and I would say often, the, um, the consent on the use of data is just something that you sign without thinking about it. Yes, I agree. I think we, had, we had a, um, a situation like that in, in um, a public health hospital in Boston um, where the the um, uh, in in the chart uh, you would make your consent. So when the patient entered, it was a chronic care hospital. Um, uh, over time, um, we began to look at that and we found that there was a lot of error, there's a lot of misconception, uh, a lot of therapeutic mis mis misconception, 
about uh, the nature of this uh, consent. And I, I, so I think that, um, uh, uh, was that, maybe that was Daniela was speaking. I, I thought that was a very good comment, an important comment. I agree with you, Kevin, also about the therapeutic misconception. I think that the whole issue of obtaining consent in the hospital or clinical context, I think, can be very confusing for lay people. I realize that the purpose of research compared to actual medical treatment. Um. Well, I mean, we, um, we, we've got another 10 minutes left, um, and I, I actually will have to go um, to, to another meeting after this, and I guess the rest of you have other things planned as well. I was wondering whether we um, should give uh, the, the, the panelists, the speakers, uh, another chance of around to, to quickly say something about uh, how they react to the other presentations. So um, I don't know whether you, you have anything to add, Søren? Well, I, I think what Diane said about uh, PPI and involvement is, is very important. It's, uh, it's increasingly recognized both by the major funders and by the Health Research Authority here in the UK that uh, especially in complex and sensitive research you ought to include uh, the group that you want to research on in the development of your research project. And it's not only a question about involving them in the informed consent uh, procedure but and designing that, but, it, but really involving them in designing the research. And uh, I, I, think, I think that's sort of the direction in which we are moving. Uh, and I think it's the right direction. Okay, thank you. D Daniela, anything you would like to add? Um, you seem to have lost Daniela. I can't see her anymore. Yes, technical problems. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. So I, I would just only add um, that I think that your proposal of a unified uh, informed consent, it's a very interesting one and goes far beyond the human brain project. So when you write your proposal, um, of course you have to write it in the light of the human brain project, but it will be a very interesting uh, uh, point to start for an harmonization of informed consent all over Europe. So uh, keep this in mind and I'm really uh, look forward to seeing your results. Okay, thank you. Um, Diane, is there anything else that you would like to add? Yeah, just one comment in relation to what Daniela said about the, the future possible implications, for example, if the research could lead to new definitions and how that might be potentially stigmatizing. And just to emphasize that the, the conditions themselves are not inherently stigmatizing, but it's the, the meanings that are going to be associated with it that make them so. But then nevertheless, I think that's why it's very important the, the way research findings are reported by researchers and also the important role perhaps of patient organizations to um, to see how such information is presented to the general public. Okay, thank you. And then Stephen, do you want to add something about what, what we've learned and how this is going to feed in, into our next steps? Well, in terms of what was just said uh, about contextualizing um, informed consent throughout Europe. I think from our perspective as well, it's important that we present this uh, SOP internally uh, in, a, in a very um, carefully contextualized way. So not uh, not to present it as a tick box exercise, but more as a to try and take this idea of a dialogue and, and internalize that within the, the standard operating procedure. Um, also this idea of trying to feed into the research design itself trying to get involvement of people beyond the project within the planning of the project. I think that would be a really useful thing. I don't know how feasible it is, but we at least have the scope to mention that and then get that on the table for future iterations of the project. So yeah, this is all very useful and um, more food for thought. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other final comments from anybody who participated? 
If not, Karen, if, just if, if I can just say um, that uh, on the um, um, uh, Daniela was speaking about, I think it was Daniela speaking about uh, the autistic um, um, patient, and um, uh, uh, I was wondering how, how do you square um, um, getting consent from the autistic uh, patient um, um, with principles of autonomy? Um, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the context. Uh, and maybe it was Soren that was saying that. Um, well, Soren, actually. Oh, okay. Um, my notes are really awful here, sorry. Um, but um, uh, uh, in this particular case, it sounded like um, it wasn't so easy to 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 um, to be assured that there was understanding on the part of the um, of the signator. So the the um, in this case it was autism. It doesn't really matter. But uh, uh, not understanding is a problem to uh, to um, uh, to autonomy that um, uh, someone can make um, self determinate uh, self determine a, a decision. Um, Soren, uh, can you help um, help us think about uh, how to square that with with autonomy? Uh, I, I, I would like to be able to help you, but I, I don't think I can. I think I think the most breached part of the Helsinki Declaration and most other research guidelines is the part which says that the person taking the consent has to ensure that the person giving the consent understands the information. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know even for uh, perfectly cognitively normal people that most people who consent to research do not understand the information at the point where they consent. Uh, yes. So, I, I, I think I think we have we, we have we have an issue here about sort of that it, it well partly if if we wanted people really to understand our research projects uh, before they consented. Uh, we would go about informing them, or we would have to go about informing them in quite different ways than we actually do. Uh, but sort of at the, at the level of regulatory ethics, of course, we have for years and years lived with the fact that we know that there is an inconsistency between what our regulations say and what actually happens. So I don't, given that we haven't solved this uh, problem for Sort of ordinary people, uh, it's difficult to see how we can solve it for people who also have various forms of cognitive or uh, other psychological problems, which makes it even more difficult for them. I wonder if, if this um, um, falls a little bit back on the question of where the work should be done. So, so the clinician has a certain relationship with a, with a patient, that's clear. Um, um, but uh, in the project, once you go uh, through the wall um, to mirror the data from the hospitals, um, uh, as Daniela was talking about, uh, in, into aggregate form, um, uh, that's all fine. But 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 informed consent is is not uh, really the issue anymore. And 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 um, um, maybe I'm missing something, but. Um, uh, it, the, the informed consent has to be back at the, the you know, at the bedside uh, um, with the patient and, and the, uh, uh, the healthcare person. Okay, that, that seemed to be more of a statement rather than a question. Oh, yes, I asked a question, then, it, then I made a statement. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so, so I, I think now is about time to wrap up.